Brian, thanks so much for being on my pod space. This is uh, yes. Tattoos Art and Web 3. And I want to thank you uh, a ton for coming and spending your time. I know your time is very precious. Uh, you are getting pulled in a zillion different directions. Uh, you are a judge on Ink Master. Uh, you are a mother of a beautiful son named Atheus. And <laughs> Atheus, who was born, what, one month after my son? Almost exactly 30 days after Ander. I remember we were going through, my girl and I were going through that dreaded like first couple weeks. And then you were texting me, you're like, I'm so nervous. I don't and know what know, I'm going to do. And you know what's weird? During that time for me, it was like, you know, we don't talk all the time, every single day, you know, and, and a few of my other friends were going through pregnancy at the same time. You fucking come together as a community because you are all so scared shitless and you're like excited and you're nervous and you actually become this like network of support for each other. You know, yeah. like I remember texting you guys and being like, what's the status? You going first. And then <laughs> you guys went a month before I did. And I was like, how was it? Tell me how it was. It's but such it's a cool. step into a new world. You know, I mean, we're all yeah. hustling tattoo artists, tattooing every day, staying up until wee hours of the night and, you know, focusing on our careers. And then all of a sudden the kiddo pops out and it's like everything has to be adjusted I mean, I, I remember the first two, two weeks, I was like, my life is over, you know, like, um, <laughs> you I, remember know? The, I remember the first three years and I was like, my life is over. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and it's much, I can't even imagine like my girl, luckily she handles the brunt of everything. I mean, she's, you know, and as a, as a female tattoo artist, I know that you had to carry probably a lot of weight, at least initially, uh, you know, with, with a theist and, and I can't even imagine, I mean, I was. I was struggling just being the, the support to my girl during that time. So the biggest thing with Arlo and I, my husband Arlo, is that um, when we found each other, we were so excited because we were like, holy shit, we found our equal, like someone that understands everything, right? And so when it comes to having a child with your equal, um, we always discuss, Arlo and I psychoanalyzed everything, right? And there's no topic off the table. And so after we had the baby, we started finding these strange, like hormonal instincts that were kicking in, right? Like my maternal instincts were like, love, feed, protect, nurture, comfort, cry. I cry in the shower every day. I still do. But, and so, and then our lows were like, were like protect, secure, make sure, you know? And so when the baby would cry, it would make me anxious. Cause I was like, oh, he's hungry. I'm doing something wrong. And it would make Arlo's cortisol levels rise, you know, because we were res responding differently. And so Arlo and I have been battling for years, basically, because I'm like, I'm not a stay at home mom. And he's like, well, I'm not a stay at home dad. And we're like, OK, well, like who we fight each other for time. And it's not time necessarily to like go out with friends and go out and party. You know, it's time for art. Like it's that mental space you need that like silence and, and clarity to kind of like zone in and be able to be creative and have the freedom to be creative. We've been like fighting each other for that. It's, it's been a, it's been a, a hard, rough journey, honestly. Um, we're definitely not the classic roles, which is a blessing and a curse, you know, because we're not sure where we fit into this puzzle, you know? Um, but this might be terrible of me to say, is it? I'm not sure, but you know, we were pregnant and you guys were pregnant during COVID. Right. Yeah. And so, um, the world changed after that and conventions stopped, uh, entire industries stopped, like the world stopped moving for a second. And for me in my reality, it was actually really convenient timing because I felt like I could actually focus in and hone in on this maternal thing and see if I could click and connect with it without having this crazy fucking dehabilitating FOMO that, you know, everything was going on without me. Um, but it's the craziest yeah. thing because like art, as you know, is a very accomplished artist, you know, to be creative, you need us, you need to feel strong emotions, but you need freedom of your own mind. And when you become a parent, your mind doesn't really belong to just you anymore. 
Right. And then also just finding those long stretches of the time. I mean, I'm sure you're the same. It takes a little while to get in that groove, you know, sometimes it'll take me a half hour, an hour just to get in that zone. And, you know, obviously when you have a kid, those, those half hours and hour long stretches aren't there. So you're just kind of squeezing it in whenever you can. You know, I, I found that I was doing a lot more drawing after he would go to sleep or try to draw early in the morning, you know, before Yeah, but I then the work. debate is like, if you wait until they go to sleep, it's like, okay, they're going to wake up at, they're going to wake up in seven hours, right? So I have to wake up in seven hours. So how much time do I designate to drawing and how much time do I designate to sleeping? Because at that right. point, sleep becomes your greatest um, currency, you know, it's your, <laughs> right. most, it's your like most valuable thing you can offer is time, you know, it's sleep. I'm like longing for sleep. Um, so you have to make that like debate in your mind. Like, do you want to get this illustration out or do you want to actually get, you know, five hours in? Yeah, and it's almost a quasi like morning of your old life too, because you know the, before it was a hundred percent dedicated to your art, dedicated to your you know significant other, and then now it's like you know obviously the kid takes easy sixty percent of that time that you used to have, and then the other forty percent is dedicated towards trying to put towards your career. And I mean, I was always kind of fighting as well. I was like, man, I don't want to be one of those fathers that kind of. I mean, I don't want to be one of those artists who just completely stops doing all the art as soon as they have a kid. But, you know, obviously once you have a kid and there's a personality there, you know, your priorities shift, whether you like it or not, you know, no, it's, it's not your choice. Other... But you know what I've been realizing recently is having, well, first of all, having a kid is not for everyone. You know, I always tell people it's not a right choice or a wrong choice. You just hit a Y in the road and you can go this way or this way. And they're both going to be, have positives and negatives and all of that. But on my personal journey, I feel like, you know, the universe serving me a theist and serving me this new role and this new identity and this new life. It's been a fucking whiplash whirlwind, <clears throat> but it definitely has. Um, it's awakened a lot of parts of me and, it, and it's it's like fast tracked my maturity in a lot of areas and made me realize at the end of the day, when you zoom out and you look at your whole life what actually fucking matters to you, right? Yep. Yeah, what the actually, priorities shift. It's cool. And, and in the end, for me, it's people, like, You start you know, thinking about you know, your kid a lot more than you think about you know, your career or art and all that stuff. Yeah, art was always number one for me. And I, obviously now it's not. You know, Now everything falls behind. The art is to support you know, the, the life for my son and try to like make sure that he's taken care of. So yeah. it does, it shifts, completely shifts your, your perspective. I also felt like I was on a conveyor belt of sorts, you know, like prior to my kid, I was just kind of like running along. As soon as my kid got up, it was like, oh shit, where am I going to be in 20 years when he gets to this point? You know, I've been hitting that as we're hitting the same. I feel like we're hitting. So we went through pregnancy together. We went through infancy together. Now we're hitting the same like mental revelations together at the same time. Like, holy shit, I've never actually thought about like that far ahead in terms of like the security of another human. Right. <laughs> right. And then you realize how, how much you live like by the seat of your pants before the kid, like the way that I lived, I was like, man, I have experienced so much in life. All of this feels like bonus round to me right at this point. So let's just play with it. Let's play with this reality. And then after you have a kid, it's like, Oh, hell no. I'm not going any, I'm not going to climb that ladder. Are you kidding me? He's about to start kindergarten. Like, you know what I mean? right. it's not about, and, and it's not like a choice. Like I can't do that because of my kid. It's like your brain first thinks of your kid, almost like in his perspective, it's not like a, a choice anymore. It's crazy. Have you ever been to Ripley's believe it or not? Yes. That, I like, love that shit. I love Ripley's. Yeah. I love the wax museums. You know the place where you go up to the mirror and they have like the screen where they do the tongue thing and you start doing this tongue thing in the mirror and then you go through Ripley's and by the time you get to the other side, you start seeing the other people do it. That's what I feel like parenthood is. It's like you live your life and then all of a sudden you get to see the perspective of your parents at the end of it. I feel like that's what I've been seeing a lot. It's like, shit, man, you know, I don't want to be mean to my kid, but I definitely don't want them to get hurt. So therefore I have to put down some strict rules and... It, it, it's really 
Cut it so, so along those lines, Arlo keeps doing this thing where I'm like, Arlo, they because they treat each other like siblings, right? And the baby's new thing is when he, he calls daddy, daddy, but when he talks about him to me, he calls him Arlo, right? And so <laughs> I swear to God, he's like, don't tell Arlo. And I'm like, buddy, that's your fucking dad, dude. But Arlo's whole thing is he's like, well, listen, he has no brothers. He has no cousins here. Cause we're out in the middle of Colorado. We don't have family and our friends don't have kids. We're like on a fucking Island out here with this toddler trying to, you know, survive. And uh, Arlo's like, I have to be his dad and his brother, which means like, you know, pranking him, all that bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, just, that's just an excuse because I do that shit too. And it's not for that reason. You just want to, I don't know, man. And, and my girl is probably exactly like you. As soon as I start being too friendly with them, she's like, you're not his friend. And then she starts throwing, dude, she sends me like a hundred reels a day on Instagram on how to be a better father. That's <laughs> like, and then, you know, she'll be sitting there. Oh, I thought he would fucking read it. I'll be like, babe, did you read what I sent you on Instagram? He'll be like, no, I couldn't sort through the fucking blizzard of shit you sent me. You sent me 20 reels. Like, he's never going to fucking. It's insane. Like, the other day, I don't check him for probably a week or so. And then I finally get in there and I shot a video of me scrolling through all these videos that she had sent me. And it probably took me at least 15 seconds to get to the bottom of it. It was crazy. And then I'll be like, Arlo, no, but did you read just this one? And I'll read it out loud to him. And he'll be like, okay, well, did it come from a .edu or a .org? Because if not, who fucking yep. knows, huh? And some and random like, influencer chick who just had a baby and started making shit up. <laughs> talking out loud and you're having a day. <laughs> all right, all right. I know we could talk about kids forever, but I am... Honestly, I'm really interested in hearing about you and, and where you came from. You know, obviously I know some of the stuff uh, that you've been through, but I'd like to, you know, kind of hatch it out a little bit. So uh, where did you come from? What, Wait, where were you born? All that you good want stuff. want biography? No, I, I mean, you know, I just want to, I want to, I want to understand where Ryan Ashley came from because I was I mean, I didn't know anything about you. And then you just like shot up out of the middle of nowhere. And I was like, whoa, this chick's cool. She does great tattoos. She's teaching seminars at my convention. Uh, and then, you know, all of a sudden you got 2 million followers. And I'm like, what the fuck? But I am interested in knowing where you came from, mm -hmm. what your, uh, you know, wh how long you've been interested in being an artist, what drove you in the position that you're in. So where were you born? Well, so before I go into this, I will say another thing I'm realizing recently is when people ask me about myself, what I'm learning is that as I'm getting older, my view of myself in the past changes. And so my autobiography is almost changing whenever someone asks me this question, because I'm seeing things with a different perspective now, if that makes sure. sense. So yeah. I've never, I haven't been asked that in a while. So let's see how this one goes. <laughs> <laughs> So, where so, were you born? <laughs> I was born in Pennsylvania. Uh, mom is a, it's like Northeast PA. Have you guys watched The Office? Uh, the Office? Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. from right outside of Scranton. So. Dude, I went to school up there. I don't know if you knew this, but I went to, uh, I went to Mount Pocono High School. Oh, I love the Poconos. Yeah, Isn't my Pennsylvania dad was. Isn't beautiful? It is very beautiful. I remember my dad was stationed in uh, Toby Hanna. Uh, you know, I don't oh know my if you know God, that. Like I used to go to Indiana all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> what? Shop because my grandpa was in the military, so we can go to the army depot and she'd fill three shopping carts up a year of like TVs and beef jerky and all that shit. <laughs> and that's, I used to always go to Toby. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Army. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I lived, I lived on that base and there was probably, I don't know, less than a hundred families that lived on that base. We were that probably base. there at the same time. Probably That's not, because I got you. I got go you by ten years. I was there in um, when was I there? I was oh, there in nineties, the early nineties. So when Late I was eighties, early nineties. So when I was six, going with my grandma, you were sixteen. Mm hmm. Were so you there? I could have been there. Yeah, I probably. I was. I was there. I was probably there. Ninety two. Ninety ninety one. Ninety two. Definitely. Six degrees of separation is real. I know. That's crazy, so, dude. Anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> 
I'm from Northeast Pennsylvania. I grew up with my mom who is, she could have been an artist, but un well, I can't even say unfortunately, cause she, it worked out for her, but I, she was a single mom growing up, raising my sister and I by herself. And, uh, we grew up in this trailer park and, and man, she was at the time she was, she ruled by fear. I was like afraid of my mom, but now as a parent, I realized she was a single fucking mom working full time, going to school at night, raising us by herself. She didn't have time to fuck around with us, you know, but she was always, and still is to this day, really, really cool. Um, she's an incredible artist. She used to be. And uh, I don't know if she does it anymore, but um, art was the one thing that she always was 100% present for me for. Uh, uh, she was really supportive and encouraging and, and all of that. And uh, it was something that we could do together, right? We never had cable. We didn't have the internet till I was like 17, you know, but we did, we did a lot of art, you know? Um, so Going from there, uh, I loved drawing and creating. And uh, because we were fucking poor, I started sewing, right? And I started getting to making all my own clothes. I made my own prom dresses. And I wanted to go into fashion. That was my thing. I either wanted to be a fashion designer or a tattoo artist. And fashion design is so much more realistic, obviously, than being a tattoo artist. I mean, who couldn't be a famous fashion designer? You know, it's so easy. Anyway, <laughs> I chose fashion and um, it was cool because I got accepted to FIT. And I think only one out of every 250 applicants get accepted into the program I got accepted into. It was really hard to get into this program. I got accepted into the program. I uh, fucking worked three jobs to pay through going to school won the critic award i got i was the critic award winner of my graduating class which means you're like i don't know the it's like the val it's not the val victoria it's not i wasn't the smartest i'm hearing voices what's going on over here <laughs> but my fashion was the coolest apparently somehow i don't know um and so then i worked in fashion for a while like i think i was a merrill diamond for about five years and when Where I was that, was that in Pennsylvania or in New York? Right. No, it was like right off of Times Square. I was in New York city for a long time. Wow. Um, but the cool thing is about that is my job for the company. When I worked in fashion was all of the designing from, from scratch, all of the lace work, the bead work, the embroidery, the applique, all of those tiny little detailed patterns to flow on the body. That was my job for years before I tattooed. And so then when I started tattooing, I left New York City. I saved up $4,000. I was like, $4,000. This is enough to last me a year of an apprenticeship. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, two months into my apprenticeship, I'm out of money. Uh, so during my whole apprenticeship, I designed Halloween costumes for Playboy. I was doing all the like, the like, Alice in Wonderland, sexy Alice, you know, sexy Finding Nemo. <laughs> that was a real one. Sexy Finding Nemo. It was called. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome though. How'd you score that job? Um, a girl I worked with in the fashion industry, also freelance. It was Ruby's clothing company. They did all the costumes for Playboy and she freelanced for them and they were looking for someone to just like send sketches in. So I would just during my whole apprenticeship, as I was doing all my art and, and you know, learning and everything, I was doing all these sketches, sending them in and getting paid like, I don't know, maybe like 200 bucks a design. And they would make probably 2 million per design. You know what I mean? They sure. would, but 200 bucks per sketch. And that got me through a lot of my apprenticeship. Um. So, and, so, real and, and then during that apprenticeship, what I did basically was the art I was doing for the last years, which was beadwork, jewelry, embroidery, all of that stuff. And it snowballed. So where did, where exactly did you do your apprenticeship and who'd you apprentice under? Oh my God. That's the first thing that's ever actually made me uncomfortable. And it's not that you can't ask. It's that I have actually <laughs> trauma with this person that I've never said out loud and we're live. So cool. Let's talk about you know, it. 
We don't have to talk about it. We don't have to no, talk, about, talk it. about it. I'm ready. All right. I don't know. Let's talk about it. <laughs> um, you did a apprenticeship in a tattoo shop in Pennsylvania. I or apprenticed under Nick Malasto. Do you know Nick Malasto? I do know Nick. Yeah. I think I met him down in Florida one time. I actually you were his biggest inspiration. So my entire apprenticeship, he had a giant print of yours hanging above my station. So I actually apprenticed looking at your artwork every single fucking day. And did that inspire all your gem work? <laughs> it was just so intricate and fine line and detailed that I, I just took, took years to master. <laughs> but no, I'm just I, I, so I have actually for real been a fan of yours for a very long time. Because he introduced me to you. So I thank him for that and many things. Um, but from from there, the cool thing is we were in a little town in Pennsylvania. And since I was doing all the jewelry stuff, I found this void in the market. There weren't very many female tattooers. It was almost 13 years ago. There weren't very many female tattooers back then, especially in my area in rural Pennsylvania, you know. And the female tattooers that were there were trying to do what they had to do to survive in the industry. So they were doing the flash and all that. No one was being, um, I don't know. I found a void of clients wanting feminine, elegant, organic tattoos that no one else was doing. And so totally by the universe, and I thank the universe every day, I hit the fucking jackpot because I hit two groups of friends in Pennsylvania, right? Two big girl groups of friends. Both of them were smoking fucking hot. Uh, one group were all of the makeup artists that worked at Ulta, which was brilliant because if I could, if they trusted me enough to give them what I thought was truly fucking unique and beautiful, they're the best advertisements ever. They're all working at Ulta. So all of the women in the area were going in seeing this stuff, you know, and then the other group of friends were all of the smoking hot strippers, right? So everyone was seeing them butt ass naked and they were the coolest, most down ass chicks. And so I somehow got these two large groups of girlfriends that were very, you know, in the public eye who, you know, by the grace of fucking God, trusted me enough to do my art on them. And I, I swear that springboarded my career, those girls did. And so I was able to develop this large portfolio of this specific style really early on, like really early on. And so this was what, 2010, 2009, 2010, somewhere in there? 2000, this is 2000, when I was doing all that was 12. 2012, gotcha. So you're, you started tattooing in 2010, 2012 is when you felt like your, your personality started. 2010, I started negotiating my apprenticeship. 2011, my apprenticeship apprenticeship started I'm pretty sure 2012 is when I was actually doing what I wanted to do wow so you've only really been tattooing for about 12 years which I guess is, is definitely yeah. a substantial amount of time uh, yeah. well no it's, but, but the, it's not though in comparison I mean, the you know. interesting thing is I remember hearing something like, you know, the first TV shows started coming out in like 2005 2006 which was like inked or Miami Ink, stuff like that and at the time, I remember it was maybe like five years after that, 2010, which was about the time you came in. And I remember them some reading something, and who knows, it could be a bunch of bullshit, but it was something like 70% of the people in the tattoo industry had come in after 2005 because of the, you know, of course, the TV shows created this wave, uh, which is really interesting. It, so, it's, also, it's also legalities, though, because believe it or not, states were still making tattooing legal um right in those years and i i'm because even when i filmed angels i think what was it arkansas had just made it legal like a few years prior is that arkansas or oklahoma arkansas it was little rock was, was it wow was it because uh, i know there was like at least in virginia it was legal in virginia but it definitely like there was parts counties in virginia that weren't legal so yeah um i remember and you know they just slowly started legalizing and of course that created more but i mean what came first the chicken or the egg was it the the wave of people trying to tattoo that started opening up the uh the interest or was it you know uh congress people watching tv shows and be like oh it's not that big of a deal well, i mean 
I think it was also the spreading of knowledge and accessibility because sure. a lot of tattooers back in the day were the, you know, machine builders and the craftsmen that would, you know, you know, uh, solder their own needles, make their own ink. Cause there wasn't, they sell tattoo machines at walmart.com now. Did you know that? walmart.com <laughs> sells i'm not fucking kidding you i'll send a link where can i put the link it's it's unreal and 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 so people the people that are tattooing now come from all walks of life but it's a direction that kids in art school can go in now which sure. previously kids that went through art school wouldn't think of tattooing as a realistic career and now you have all of these artists looking for their specific branch and so it's blossoming and blooming along with the societal development of the acceptance you know mainstream of, of you know the whole culture did you ever have to make any your uh make any needles or do any of that type of stuff did you ever use a, so, a coil machine so i'm the in-between generation where i had to not only start on the coil machine i had to figure out how to disassemble and reassemble it before i was allowed to tattoo you know I'm that generation, but not making ink or soldering needles. I, gotcha. I'm right in between. I'm before the rotary, but I, I'm pre-rotary, but post-soldering, if that makes soldering. sense. Yeah, I, I need, had to make needles back in the days. And they even had pre-mades, sure. but it was like, it was very um, taboo to use a pre-made when I started tattooing. So if you were using pre-mades, oh, you were lazy. Totally. And then remember when cartridges were taboo? Uh huh. Yep. And people are like, wait, no, this is actually like way more like sterile and like easy and safe and convenient. And I used to travel when I would travel, I needed like a massive suitcase to carry all my tubes and all my needles and five different tattoo machines and my, you know, my, um, uh, power, uh, power supply with the fucking pedal and all that shit. And now I can travel with this much shit. It's awesome. I remember the pedal days. My pedal would get so filthy and I'd fucking mad aside it every night and be like, it's only been one day. It was gross. <laughs> yeah, it was that was disgusting. Gross. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely in easier times. I mean, I've seen, that? I, saw, I think I saw Sarah Fable the other day tattooing in the middle of a field. You know, she just had it all laid out. And I, Isn't it beautiful? And as long as it's a gorgeous, listen. People have been doing tattoos for thousands of fucking years. They just found that 3,000 year old preserved um, Egyptian mummy with, it was a priestess, like a, like a high up, like spiritual priestess woman with like lotus flowers up her throat and a sleeve of deer and all of that shit. Interesting. I didn't hear about that. This episode is brought to you by the Richmond Tattoo and Arts Festival. This year, J.D. Crow and I will be bringing you a massive list of talented artists such as Ryan Ashley, Dave Conant, Eddie Stacy, Kevin Leroy, Corey Miller, Sean Barber, Jack Rudy, and a ton of other artists. Some of the best of the best will be right here in Richmond, Virginia on October 20th through the 22nd. If you'd like more info, you can go to richmondtattooconvention.com. Hope to see you there. Man, fucking mummy bodies. Anyway, in Peru, do you see? Are you follow following all that shit? What's going on with the um, disclosure in the United yeah. States? I was actually going to bring that up to you because I know that you have that you enjoy aliens. But that shit that it was in Mexican Congress, they unveiled those two mummies that they had found in Cusco, Peru. They were like in some mines, a thousand years old. I wa we watched this documentary. It was a 2017 documentary. Okay. Here, you want to hear a real fucking story? Yes. Hey, is this what you want to talk about on your podcast or no? Yeah, dude, we can talk about whatever you want. Okay, cool. <laughs> I would rather talk about something I'm actually passionate about than being like, what's your favorite color? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um. As a black and gray tattoo artist. <laughs> but, I, but I only paint in color. Oh, so what is your favorite color? Right now, it's an emerald. Oh, that's, that's fucking shit. Tell me about aliens. Velvet emerald. It has to have a velvet texture to it. So I got really fucking... I was never interested in aliens ever. I'm a, I was a little girl interested in mermaids and art and all that shit. And when I was young, there was not... We didn't even have cable. 
we had ABC, NBC, PBS. We didn't have any of that shit. No internet, anything. I didn't know anything about aliens, technology, any of that shit. And so when I was eight years old, I was in my room drawing a picture of a mermaid that my mom still has. She laminated it. Um, so it says Ryan Ashley, age eight. I was drawing this picture of this mermaid and um, we lived in a trailer park. My mom and my sister and I lived in the trailer park and we lived it all the way at the top of this hill in Pennsylvania. And the trailer was on the top of the hill so that like if, if a trailer is almost like shaped like a shoe box, the long end of the shoe box went on the top of the hill and then the back of the shoe box, the little, the little part, the little square, it had about a two foot landing around the trailer and then it dropped off like a big drop off hill which is fucking awesome to, you know, uh, sled and shit in the winter, but, um, it was a big drop off and you could overlook the whole, you know, trailer park from there. And so I'm laying in bed doing this drawing and I heard this sound that I thought was an airplane and I'm like, Whoa, it's an airplane. And I recognize it was pretty loud. And then it wasn't going away. And I was like, Oh, it's probably someone just mowing their lawn like down. And then I'm thinking to myself, it's dark outside. Who would be mowing their lawn in the dark? Right. And this is going on for a few, like a, a minute or so. Like it's, it was a weird amount of time where I got suspicious. So I got up out of bed and I walk over to the window and I was only eight as the drawing says. And I, and my blinds were down. I couldn't see out of the window. So I, I remember specifically reaching my arm up and grabbing the blinds. And my face was like directly in the bottom pane of the window. It was like a two pane window and my face was in the middle. And I reached up and I ripped open the blinds to look. And there was a fucking craft hovering outside of my window, hovering there, right there. It was three lights, one, two, three feet away, like a few feet away, right? And I stood there and I was so fucking freaked out that I froze. I remember standing there staring at it. And after a few seconds, enough for me to take it in, it goes, and it zoomed off so fast. It in my mind, my memory, it looks like one of those um, long exposure traffic pictures where the light in a long exposure is a long red line because you're, you know, the photo couldn't keep up with the, the light. Like my mind couldn't keep up with how fast it went. So I saw two red streaks and out of the corner of my eye, I saw there was a second one at a trailer, like a quarter of a mile down and they went off together. And I was so fucked up about this that um i remember like i and i remember nothing after that and then when i tell the story usually my mom takes over this part and tells the rest of the story and says that i came out of the room running so fast and she said i was she she grabbed me and she looked at me and she said i was so freaked out my face was like white and she said my lips were like blue like i was so scared that i couldn't speak i couldn't you know whatever and um I remember after that, like, it took a long time to get over it. And my mom being the cool ass fucking bitch that she is, she ruled with this instead of dismissing me, telling me I didn't see it, telling me it was blah, 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 blah. She supported me and then silently did her own research. And at that time it was hard. We didn't have the internet. There was no, you know, you had to actually try to research and she found, um, a bunch of people like nationally that claimed they had stories super similar to mine and we used to talk about it and she used to support me and all of that. And so um, my interest in aliens doesn't come from some sci-fi fucking matrix movie fanatic thing. It came from a really fucking jarring personal childhood experience that I couldn't explain. And for years after that, I was so scared to talk about it. Like, what are you going to go to junior high and tell people you saw a UFO? I'm already the fat girl in the trailer park. Like no one wanted to be friend with, friends with me. Like I was poor, awkward, really chubby because all I ate was fucking ramen. It was not, I was not cool. And my last name was Malarkey. Who wanted to be friends with me? It was traumatizing being in my body during those years. Um, so I wasn't going to be the UFO girl as well, you know? And it took me years to come into myself and be comfortable with who the fuck I am and be, you know, um, feel secure enough to talk about what actually happened to me. And so I'm excited about all of this shit now, because even as a child, I experienced the stigma of seeing something and not being comfortable to say, to say what you saw. 
And so now that all this stuff is coming out, I am so fucking supportive and I'm so fucking um, open to it because all you can know as truth in this reality is something that you see or experience for yourself. Everyone has an individual idea of what truth is. And for me, that's always been the truth. So now that it's a movement and more people are coming out with actual fucking evidence, it makes me feel justified and at home. And it makes me feel proud of all those people that weren't afraid to speak their mind and say what they saw and what they experienced. And I'm all about it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting. And of course, I think that, you know, I think everybody can agree that the the only thing that's really going to bring all humanity together is a common enemy. So everybody's got to have something to direct their energy the towards. They've been ma they manipulating our DNA for thousands of years. It's the missing link. We're genetically modified, Jesse. The evidence is sure. Hey. <laughs> I'm not saying that they are the enemy, but I am saying that in order for people to stop hating each other, they got to find something else to hate. And I think that the aliens well, might possibly, or the, the thought of aliens well, existing may possibly start pointing people's brains in different directions. Well, hate definitely brings people together, but so does love. And that I think true. what we should realize is that through all of our differences, we're still human beings. And once we encounter a separate species, it's going to bring us together because we're going to realize we are all actually the same when we're finally faced with something that's so extraterrestrial. It's going to bring us together. Not that we have to hate, like, okay, we can be done hating each other now. Now we can all together hate this thing. You know, yeah. unfortunately, well, it's, it's probably going to be that because people are fucking ignorant. I mean, and it happens everywhere though, right? When you ever go, you know, you get a bunch of, uh, one type of ethnicity in a country that's, uh, you know, has a majority of another ethnicity, it brings the one ethnicity together. And I notice it, you know, just traveling around the world, you know, you go into another country, everybody gets a little more um, comfortable. They're a lot more comfortable with the people that, that look like them. So it's almost like you have to be uh, a minority to get united in so, at some capacity. And, and I think that if we get invaded by aliens, that will create that situation. I mean, it's not just human nature, it's nature. Did you watch Chimp Empire on Netflix? Chimp Vampire? Chimp Empire. No. Oh, Jessica. Chimp Empire. Chimp Empire? <laughs> Did you watch it? No, Jessica. I didn't. Do give it 20 minutes. Do you have 20, 20 minutes in your life? You can watch it with the family. You got to see this shit. Chimp Empire. It is fucking wild, dude. But it's basically this group of scientists lives in, um, it's called Nanganga. Oh, fuck, I forget what it's called. They, they live in the jungle for like two and a half years with this family of chimpanzees, like live with them and film their every move, right? But now with these fucking cameras and shit, it looks like it's, it looks like it's CGI. You can't believe it's real. But the entire docu, docu series documentary follows them and and shows how social they are how political they are how there's love and war and romance and betrayal naturally and it's so when it comes to things like you know we were just talking about how humans have to hate and all of that it's not just humans man it's like this weird natural order and chaos sort of dynamic i think consciousness has to have like you have to have something to strive for and the comfort of people being on your team and you're together fighting this other team. It's weird. So you think that we were all monkeys at one time, the aliens came down and injected us with their DNA and then turned us into humans. I think there's been like 23 different genetic variations since then. Um, but yes. So is that where 23 and me came from? <sighs> wow. <laughs> I believe they've got it. It's actually more than 23 now, at least as far as the DNA. I think it's like 46 at least, but I don't fucking know. But it, it does sound pretty coincidental. But if you, the thing is, is people think it's so crazy until educated, highly regarded people are, are finally now with all the communication, bringing all of their separate evidence and, and investigations together and, and formulating an actual like idea of what could have happened everyone's putting the pieces together finally, right? Everyone's sharing yeah. information and it's very highly educated people being on that level, high enough and educated enough and, and 
intellectual enough to open our minds to realize that maybe we've been in a fucking petri dish and we are the amoeba under the microscope like sure. it's to me very ignorant to whether it's spiritual or physical in terms of science and numbers it doesn't matter where where you are on the spectrum it's not probable that human beings are the only life form in hundreds of billions it's it's not it would be so ignorant and sad for us to believe that's the truth and if that is the truth then we're in a simulation then we're in a simulation and there's a filter on us that we can't see the other shit i'm not kidding it's Look, I, I'm not, I'm not knocking what you're saying. Everything you're saying makes sense to me. I mean, I, I've always thought it was a bit, uh, I mean, it, it is, it's crazy how massive the, the, the fucking universe is and to think that there's nothing out there. I guess the question is, is how does that, how, how do those, those particular beings get to the, get to earth, you know, well, and no. without us seeing it happen or is it interdimensional it type the, shit? It was the fall of Atlantis and Lemuria. It was a pre-stone age global civilization that left all of these megalithic structures that were now predating to 150,000 years pre stone age. They're proving now there's misplaced artifacts. There's ancient computers, all the shit they're finding. And it was from the young Adrias, the great flood that was finally wiping out this. I'm way down so, the rabbit hole, dude. So my question is, is did the flood happen when the earth was flat or when it was round? Depends on how many psychedelics you took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me answer the question. The earth has all always right. been. Around. But all you know, right. I did spend a week once with a flat earther. And I'm not going to lie. They were cool as fuck and they were really convincing. And they came to me with like educated answers and information that I actually couldn't debate. And it did leave me being like, something's weird. Not that I'm a flat earther, but I enjoyed my company with them very much because they brought this new perspective with information and. and Dude, it was cool. it's crazy. I don't know how you feel, but I feel like every documentary I watch, I'm like super naive. Every documentary I watch, I'm like, yeah, veganism is the best way to go. And then right after that, I'll watch some like keto thing and they'll be like, keto is the way to go. You know, you and it's watch, like every. Did you watch, that? did you watch Fantastic Fungi? No, <laughs> no. <gasps> how do you have time to watch TV? You have a kid. I don't have, all I watch is is uh, uh, The Lion King and The Little Mermaid over and over and over. <laughs> well, congrats. You know what Atheus is on right now? What? Watching adult hands play with toys. Oh, no. Too, my kid does too, man. That's like the ASMR for the kids. Like so all I, the little squishing yeah, yeah, the... Weird. It, I guess it's kind of like Twitch for toddlers, but... It, I've been sitting there on my phone <laughs> Googling the net worth of these adults that play with these toys. You know, they're worth like $60 million. Dude, I was, I actually watched that last night with my kid to put him to sleep. <laughs> it, was like, I'm like, it was like marbles, like, like and going into like wax and shit. And all that weird shit. And they're squishing the, the powder soap and yeah, yeah it's but really it's strange. And I'm like, if you make $63 million a year playing with toys, at least paint your nails, get a manicure. Have you ever, my TV is like 80 inches. So I see these people's cuticles and I'm like, you make $60 million a year and you can get a fucking manicure? Put some lotion on before you play with this slime. Wait, each one of them makes 60 mil or the industry oh, as a whole makes 60 mil? List. I am on this shit. I can't believe. Because you know what? You know why it pisses me off? This is why it pisses me off. Because the other day I tattooed a 12 year sex crimes investive, investigative like detective who makes less money than these people. And she is, she is going to work doing the hardest fucking job one can imagine, like donating her life to help these people and, and these victims and all this. She has to on a daily basis, deal with this traumatic, horrible shit and be there for these people and fight for them. And she makes less than YouTubers that are playing with fucking kids toys. It's fucked up. Like, I mean, we definitely are in a lopsided world. I mean, I'm sure you've seen not, it. Uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, look at, look at all the people that are doing well in this world. They're typically the more controversial people and they're the ones that are stimulating, uh, you know, the stimulating 
emotion. I mean, fuck, that's something that we learned about. In, um, right. And they're, also, Master. and they're also stimulating capitalism and materialism and all these. Yeah. What does that say about us as a society that we're feeding into that shit, though? Right. Hey, man, we're a part of the problem as well, but it's I fuck. hate it because I fucking love Kanye West and Conor McGregor and Elon Musk and all these guys that stir up, stir the pot, man. I, I don't, I'm sure if I met them in real life, I'd probably hate them, but they're no, super interesting to me. No, I've heard from a few people that Elon is the coolest fucking dude ever. And my three-year-old wears Elon Musk t-shirts to school regularly. That's awesome. <laughs> hey man, I, I commend him on his ability to fucking express himself freely and not give a fuck what anybody thinks. And he's not, I mean, the no, total, no, sorry. I cut you off. I'm just very excited. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of his. I mean, I've, I've been a big fan of his for a long time and you know, anything that he gets involved in, I know he's going to make it better in the long run. So I'm definitely the, a, a Elon fan. And the thing is, is like every human being has shades of good and shades of bad. Elon of Musk is not mother Teresa, man, but he is at least independently doing things He's taking strides to better our species in ways, and he's taking risks, and he's doing it as on his own fucking dollar. You For know sure. what I mean? He's no. not taking the American people to experiment. He's making the money, and he's trying to progress our fucking species in whatever way he feels best. And it's not up to us. It's his fucking money. At least he's going to Mars, and he's not fucking, you know what I mean? He's not launching a makeup line. He's going to Mars. Right. He's going to Mars. We're going to... We're not going to celebrate this human? Like, what the fuck is wrong with us? But the interesting part is, as far as I understand, he, uh, what did he say when you start talking about aliens? He's like, I, you know, I haven't seen any. He said that they're good at hiding or something along those lines. He also smokes a lot of weed. Oh, does he? I don't know. He has <laughs> with Grimes, dude. I feel like she probably spent 14 years on acid, that girl. You have to smoke weed to have three kids with Grimes. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Let's get back on track. Okay. Apprenticeship. So you had your apprenticeship back in uh, 2011, 12, somewhere in there. And then you that was right. You started building your portfolio pretty quickly off of strippers and, and Ulta, Ulta uh, makeup artists. Is that what it was? They were, but they were also the... Man, those, the Ulta girls and all of those strippers, man, they were the coolest, fucking most supportive, trusting. I like leveled up as a human because of those two groups of girls. I'm very grateful and thankful still today. Um, and then after that, I, um, one of my biggest passions in life is I like to collect weird shit. I like antiques and oddities and growing up in Pennsylvania, um, uh, we used to yard sale and flea market and all of that, you know, constantly. And um, I met my ex. His name is Josh. We're still, we're still pretty good friends. He's a cool. I met Josh. What was you he? What band Josh? was he in? You know Josh. He's the coolest, right? Yeah. He's what, what band was he in again? Was it White he Water was rapping was in, or something? He was, was in White. Oh, okay. yeah. I remember. Yeah, it's it definitely He's a, a group that. Dude, man. He's great. Yeah, he's super um, sweet. I, I still talk to him time to time on, on the I Instas. Talk him, I talk to him all the time. He sends me hot dog memes and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> he, came, he actually came to the Richmond convention in 2019 when you were there. Did he? He's a good dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, but during that, when I met Josh, during that time, I was having really bad, bad issues at my studio. Um, I Was got, this the one that, was this Nick, the one you worked at with Nick or? Got it. Okay. So I got really busy and really booked really fast. And without going into details, uh, I actually did experience a lot of really not okay psychological abuse based on the fact I was a female and it became really uncomfortable and intolerable. Like, and I could take a fucking lot. Trust me. I grew up in like redneck Pennsylvania. I am a country girl, you know, I can take a lot. And it, it became really just not okay and so i had to leave the studio for my fucking well-being and and all that and i didn't know where to go i didn't know where to go and what to do and josh and i had a huge collection of all these i mean huge like garages full of weird shit we've accumulated and 
we were like, fuck it. Let's just, let's open a little boutique. I'll tattoo. I'll have a little area with my tattoo and the front will be like a cool oddity shop or whatever. And so Josh and I, I left the studio, went to this place. We opened an oddity shop. I tattooed in the back of it by myself and the store fucking blew up. I mean, opening day, I think large part to Josh being in a really popular band. Josh was like a, Josh had like a really loyal, like cult following, you know? And so the first day we opened the store, we had 500, 500 people like in line waiting to come in. It was fucking wow. crazy. Um, and so, uh, somehow someone Josh knew was competing on Ink Master and he was like, you should do this. You should do this. And I was like, I don't know. I'm not ready. I don't know what I'm doing. I was only a couple years in, you know? And so they called me and asked me to come be a part of season six. And I was like, I'm not ready. I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do season six. No. And then a year later, Josh and I were opening our second oddities parlor taxidermy shop in Philadelphia. We worked on it for the whole year and they asked me to be a part of season seven and the big grand opening of our new Philadelphia shop that we worked on for so long was happening during the filming. And they wouldn't obviously let me leave and, you know, go be a part of it. You're in the competition to win it. You're in it, you know? And so I turned it down again, season seven. And so I can't believe they asked me a third year in a row. They asked me to come on season eight. And I was like, you know what? I'm actually cool. I can do it. Like I'm at a place in my life where I'm ready to come compete. And at that time I had been working for a few years now by myself in a dark room in the back of the store with no windows and no, no one else working with me. And I wanted to grow. I didn't, I did not go on Ink Faster thinking I was good. I didn't go on thinking I was going to win. I didn't go on thinking I was going to be the best or any of that. Fuck that. I wanted to go on because I couldn't believe life opened that opportunity for me. And I wanted to meet people and I wanted to network and I wanted to learn. I did. And uh, then when I got on Ink Master, I, Kelly Doty walked in day one and Kelly Doty was during my apprenticeship. Nick used to tell me, he used to be like, look at this girl, look at this girl. This is the level you need to be at to be good. You need to eventually be as good as this girl. And so during my apprenticeship, Kelly Doty was my, like, she's my goal, like to get as good as Kelly. And so I looked up to Kelly for so long, for so many years. And so day one, we walk in, Kelly walks in and I was like, all right, I just have to get through the first episode, <laughs> just the first episode. Like I can't be eliminated first. I just need to get through the first episode. Um, and then during that experience, it was the first time for me I had ever spent like a large amount of time around tattooers like that. And it, I swear to God, television, not television, Ink Master, whatever, it changed my fucking life. It changed my life. It changed my perspective. It changed my understanding of tattooing. It, it, it changed how I saw myself, how I saw my tattoos. It was a really, um, what do they call it? Tough love look in the mirror at myself and my talent and my life. And, and, uh, man, everything from there has been a blur <laughs> to be honest. I mean, you had some heavy hitters on that season um, too. You had, uh, from Nikki there, I became Gia such, was on there. Yeah. I became such good friends with the girls, you know, in, in Ink Master in the old studio where we all shot, there's a girl's room and a boy's room, right? Girl's room and a boy's room. All of us girls were, were, we should have been competitive with each other. We weren't. We pushed all of our beds together and made one long mega bed and we all slept together and we did our makeup together and we fucking held hands. And it was such an organic, true, natural bond that it carried over. So from Ink Master, we got two seasons of Angels, Ink Master Angels, where Basically, me, Nikki, and Kelly got to travel the country for a few months at a time, going from city to city, tattooing incredible, deserving people, doing good in these cities, having fun with each other at the same time. And in hindsight, we, me, Nikki, and Kelly, and all of the producers, 
sorry, Maddie, and all of the producers together have all been being like, yo, did we peak during Angels? Was that like, oh. is it just me? Or was that like the best time of like everyone's life? Everything's been downhill from there, right? Are we on the same page? Okay. We peaked filming Angels. It was like, I swear to God, I could die and be like, yo, thank you. I know I'm only 36, but like, it's about quality, not quantity. Like angels made my life really fucking fulfilled. Um, and then I thought my career would be done after that. Right. After that, we did grudge match and I got to come back with clean and DJ. And that was fucking amazing. I fucking love those dudes. I talked to both of them today, actually. Um, and then after Grudge Match, Ink Master relaunched and they asked me to be a part of it. And so here we are. And so that's the new one. Mm. It's uh, so you've got uh, Ami as a judge and then Nico Hurtado. And then I'm, I'm probably going to sound like an idiot, but I have no the good Charlotte guy. Oh, <laughs> Joel Madden. Joel's I mean, the best. I, unless he was on Kanye West's record, I don't know who he is, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Dude, I, um, he seems like I, a cool dude, though. I didn't know any very much about Joel before I had met Joel. Um, when, when Good Charlotte was really popular, I was in a totally different music scene. You know, it just wasn't my genre. <clears throat> and so I pretty much came into meeting Joel blind. And, um, you know, when you film, you spend a lot of time together. You spend a lot of time with the people you film with. And I've spent a, a lot of time with all of those dudes. And um, they're all incredible. But Joel is like, I don't know. He's one of those people you meet in your lifetime where you're like, wow, this dude is like actually inspiring for real. And he like makes you want to be better just from his energy. Like he's, oh, that's nice. he's a solid fucking dude. Yeah. That's awesome. So do you have... <laughs> Do you, I mean, do you feel like you, you have like, is there like somewhat teams where you guys are sitting there like, all right, you guys are always voting for this type of stuff and we're always voting for this type of stuff. Uh, in, in well, the, that the, the cool thing is, is like, as opposed to the original Ink Master where um, Oliver and Chris came from um, different backgrounds, but similar in a sense of they were the same era, right? All of their, like their generation was the same. And I think right. every 10 years, perspectives change based on the world, based on the industry. And so the cool thing about that season we filmed was, you know, I was a little over 10 years in, Nico was a little over 20 years in, and Ami was 30 years. So it was mm. three different generations and three different perspectives, as opposed to, you know, two friends talking shit from the same generation, from the same perspective, from the same, it was, you know, three different eras of tattooing, trying to battle what fundamentals were actually the most important. And I, and so I think it made it way more diverse. I learned a lot. Um, and I think it's, you know, even, even with kids, they're, they're showing studies now where kids actually learn more and it's more progressive for kids to be in mixed age groups, right? Because you learn from the young ones, you learn from the older ones. It's, it's a collective more so, right? Not just one ruling generation that says what the standard is. Right. And so I think with having three different generations, there wasn't, we couldn't let a standard slide that none of us, that we didn't all agree on from every perspective, you know, from the rotary generation to the, you know, to the, da, 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 da. It, it's, it's more of a broad spectrum of, of what actually creates a solid tattoo. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, I feel like the couple, you know, when you go to a tattoo convention and they have the judges, I feel like the best judging is when you have, people who can kind of see these tattoos from different perspectives, you know, some person like myself, I'd probably be looking more towards the creativity of the art. And then you have like more of a traditional artist who's looking more for the application legibility, you know, so getting that, I think winning, winning ink master with this set of judges uh, is a pretty substantial uh, hit for whoever does who won last time. DJ. Oh, again, it was a big debate. <laughs> I don't know if we're even allowed to no season 14 so season 14 dj won for the third fucking time 
And um, it was interesting because it was really highly, it was another finale. I mean, every finale is up for a lot of debate, right? A lot of debate. And for me, I had like a nervous fucking breakdown off stage, to be honest with you, about that deliberation because the truth is we don't know who we're going to vote for before we get up there like the contestants can change our mind it's art it's objective and so it's this job is not easy judging because art is so subjective so you have to go to those things and um with dj winning it was like motherfucker like dj is a friend very good friend of mine but i'm like motherfucker you won this thing three times what the fuck like let, let someone else win And I have this, to be honest, this like trauma with Gion because I, Gion was runner up season eight when I won and I love Gion so much, man. He is such a good fucking dude and he is such a good fucking artist. And everyone always asks me like, how does it feel to win? How does it feel to be the winner? And the truth is, man, when you get that far into the season and you're at the finale with those people, they're your family at that point. They're your family. Gion was my family. And Kelly was my family. So it didn't feel as good to win as I wanted it to. And I've had like survivor's guilt since, you know, especially with Gion. And so when it came down to ultimately being between DJ and Gion, I was like, wow, am I really going to vote for DJ and do this to Gion again? I'm going to personally do this to Gion again? Like, and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do that to him, man. He, Gion deserves the world. But for me, it, it had to come down to the game. It had to. You had to put your personal relationships aside, your friendship aside, all of that. It comes down to the fucking tattoos and you need to be able to express your actual opinion. And that's my job as a judge. And everyone had a different opinion, but we should have different opinions because it's not a football game. You know what I mean? It's not like we all watch a goal go into a net and we all agree on it. It's art. And it's, it's a matter of what inspires you and all of that. But with Ink Master, it also comes down to how you play the game, fundamentals. What does it mean for you to be an Ink Master? And and for me, I specialize in black and ju- black and gray, like fine detailed jewelry shit. I didn't win on a black and gray fucking jewelry piece. I won on a 90s new school chrome fucking tattoo of dueling hot rods. I did it with coil machine. Like, That's to me what being an ink master is, right? It's a competition that you could kick ass in many different forms. And um, so for me, it came down to DJ and uh, it was crazy. That finale was fucking crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I can only imagine. I know that the times that I'm judging tattoo competitions, you know, when you get two amazing pieces, the, you always end up settling back on the the application, you know, and then it's like, okay, can I find a wiggle or a booger in here, or can I find a a fade that's not super smooth or a composition or something? But you know, when you get two people that are that good, uh, you know, how do you judge? It is very subjective. It it, it really was. I mean, I could talk so, to you for another hour about those two tattoos. You want to go into them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess my question is: so you ultimately ended up voting for DJ? Is that what happened? And then was it across the board that all four judges vote DJ or? No, um, it was a split vote. Nico and Ami picked Gian. Me and Joel mm. picked DJ. And so it was the first time the whole season it was a tie and it was a legit for real tie. Like we really were at a crossroads. And I, obviously, the, you know, filming goes on a lot longer than was shown. This went on for hours. Wow. Hours. We debated, like heated debate, like like Jerry Springer, me lunging over, yelling, embarrassed still about the shit that I did. Thank God it wasn't on camera, because um, we're passionate about it, right? But it was split, and so it went to all the other artists that were eliminated, and they all cast a vote, and they all voted for DJ. So it went into his favor. The judges ourselves, we were split. It was the other right. contestants that chose DJ in the end. Interesting. Yeah, that's like some survivor shit. I remember in uh, season seven, we had to, to vote uh, either Christian or Clean off. And Clean's tattoo, he was doing some fine line, you know, black and gray stuff. And it was so ugly. But the application was like perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean? Doesn't and then Christian's. Doesn't it yeah, suck? Yeah, I mean, 
Christians was so much more aesthetically pleasing, but the application was a little more sloppy than, than clean. So in the end I did, I fell back on and you know, clean didn't get to pick his style. So he got stuck with a shitty style, yeah. but in the end I ended up falling back on cleans cause cleans was clean. <laughs> I know, but it's, but even that isn't so straightforward because it's like, right. if one is applied technically perfectly, but it, the image is dog shit and no one would want it on them. It's still a tattoo. You know what I mean? It's a tattoo on someone's body. And if the other right. tattoo is not applied perfectly, but the artwork is innovative and cool and it makes you feel something, it is art as well. And art is supposed to make you feel something and not just feel like that looks like dog shit. You know what I mean? Good job on the <laughs> shitty tattoo. You know, it's like, uh, how do you choose? Right. Yeah. And I noticed that, you know, the longer I've been tattooing, uh, cleanliness is just not the priority anymore. It's more about, like you said, the, the, the image and how the image looks. And I think back when I first started tattooing, this was prior to, uh, Pixar when things weren't perfect. So then making things perfect was kind of like the goal. And then once Pixar came out and everything was perfect, I was like, okay, how can we, how can we make this feel like it was done by a human and not by a, a program like CGI or whatnot? But then, so but maybe then I'm you, making excuses. No, but then you look at some of the most beautiful, coveted, you know, world-renowned paintings in the whole world, and they're gorgeous. And when you get up really close to them, it's sloppy as shit. Yeah. Sloppy. Well, I mean, I feel – I don't know how you feel. When I, when I used to go to museums, I would always like to look at the polished stuff. And then I think as I – uh, got more into art. I got bored of seeing the polished stuff and I wanted to see the looser things. So some of my favorite paintings are the ones that I've done with Lalo because Lalo forces me to get dirty. <laughs> so it's like, it just has so much more happy accidents and interesting pieces to it. But that's the thing as an artist, it's, it's hard to know when to stop. Right. Right. And you don't yep. recognize your own beautiful mistakes. Sometimes other people do like all, some of our all the artists we have in Elysium, the majority of them, no, if not all, all of them, all of them are fucking crazy. <clears throat> I mean, crazy artists outside of tattooing. And, you know, I'll come in and somebody will be sitting there doing an underpainting and I'll be like, oh my God, it's amazing. And they'll be like, dude, what? This is just, a, <laughs> this is just an underpainting. And I'm like, you should bang these out. What are you talking about? So it's, it's, it's in the eye. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you right. know, a lot of the time, but as the artist, it's hard to practice restraint. It's hard to be loose, especially as a tattooer where you pride yourself on the technical application where everything is, especially on Ink Maxter, looked on, under a microscope on a giant HD TV, pick apart every pore, you know, it's hard to untrain yourself enough to be able to be like loose and have that freedom again. Yeah, no, that is very interesting. You know, the, the, the journey of a tattoo artist into the art world versus the journey of an artist into the tattoo world. And I think that, you know, the beginning of my career definitely started mostly, in, I mean, I did graffiti and stuff like that, but tattooing is majority of my life. And the first, you know, seven, eight years, I was forced to do what was on the wall as perfectly as possible. And if you didn't do that, then you were going to get a complaint. Uh, well, then as you start getting to a position where you can express yourself a little bit more, uh, that's when you start getting a little more free with your line work and, and uh, application. I think that's the biggest um, uh, dispute between the old timers and the newcomers is the old timers are tattooers that slowly became artists and the newcomers are artists that are trying to figure out how to be tattooers. And so sure. it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. art school kids without proper apprenticeships, without proper training that are watching YouTube. And, you know, I didn't go through probably, I'm sure the apprenticeship you went through, but my apprenticeship was fucking grueling. And so you have this like frat boy mentality of like, I went through it. You should go through it, you know? But the truth is, is that if we want tattooing to progress and proceed, it is that perfect combination of artistic skill and technical application. application yeah for sure yeah i mean i think the same thing in the painting world if you don't know how to apply a painting uh correctly then you can have a lot of archival issues in the future and your artwork won't stand up you know a lot of illustrators will do that they'll sit there and they'll put tar on there and you know 
glue and yeah, leaves and shit like that. And then things destroyed in like four years. Yeah, but, uh, but then, then you, you get these. Well, what did they create it for? Did they create it for longevity or did they create it for the expression in the moment? Sure. And I mean, a lot of those editorial illustrators and, and stuff are, are doing it for, you know, an image in the magazine or, or at least back back with when I was studying that stuff. Um, but yeah, then you get into the archival stuff and it's like, do you want your paintings that you just sold for 5,000 bucks to a client to, to die off in 20 years? I mean, you want that thing to last. So, that, you know. But, you know, when you first start out as an artist, you don't care about any of that stuff. You're just Jesse, trying to create art. I hate art. to tell you, honey, nothing lasts. That's true. You're right. Except for uh, all the paintings in the museums with all the uh, conservationalists. What are they? Con conservators? They've I think they're called. Insane. Yeah, the conservators. I actually had a painting conserved here in Richmond. It was very interesting. They know the, all the chemistry behind lacquers and paints and how to pull a little layer off and put a new layer on. I mean how the red paint interacts with the green paint. It's really, really interesting stuff. I love painting, but I do, when I work on a painting, I'm working on this painting right now, for example, and it is so fucking intense. And I use, I don't use reference. I don't have a plan. I get fucking so stoned and I sit down with all of these oil paints and I make shapes and then the shapes become things and the things become figures. And then they, Eventually, at the end, I step back and it gives me the message and I name it, right? But that painting takes me like a year, like a year. But it's year. a lot more fun, right? I mean, you, you feel like you're not, you don't have these like, you know, restrictions uh, of, of working with a, you know, essentially being um, hired by a client to create something. There's no standard to uphold. You're right. just seeing what comes out of your mind. And, and it's therapy almost. It's more therapeutic than designing for a client or designing for a job or something that has stipulations, regulations, there's customers to please, you know, this is just right. whatever makes your own mind feel like it's done or it's ready. It's like, it speaks to you almost, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important. It's important for artists to, to always have their side work where they're not, there's not a client involved in the process at, at any capacity because then you can get more experimental and then once you start getting experimental, you learn these new things that you can bring into your your client work more confidently, you know? Yeah. Is All this right, what so we're tell me about I was like, is this what we're supposed to be talking about? We can talk about whatever. There's no uh, rules here. <laughs> sure if there's a uh, set list. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, I definitely had stuff written down just in case you know, you had issues talking, but you don't have any issues talking, so we can talk about whatever. We should talk about uh, it soon, though, because I am really fucking stoked. And there are some announcements that, well, not, they're like important announced. Like, they're not important, but I'm excited about them. About the Richmond convention? Yeah, I'm fucking. Oh, yeah, you're, you're coming this year, right? It's my. <laughs> I'm just playing. So. Let's, if I'm let's, invited, uh, can I come? You're. Of course you can. Of course you can. You came back in 2019 and that was probably the, one of the best years that I've thrown the convention, uh, was, it was, was in good. 2019. It, it was, was a good time. Good. We had a big sushi, sushi dinner. I sat in between Sanaderm Steve and Jaded Moon and Jaded Moon. We had a topless sushi dinner. We had topless sushi with Jaded Moon. It was incredible. <laughs> it was amazing. From what I understand, anything that has to do with Jaded Moon is topless. So, oh, um, I listen. Is she coming this year? Is Jaded? No, Moon she's not. I wish she was. She had so much fun. I, I, she was like making this cop feel so uncomfortable at the last convention. He was like blushing. She was coming on to him so hard. I enjoy her very much. She's awesome. She's super yeah. sweet too, and it's, she's so intimidating. When I first met her, she like. Gave me the stare, and I just felt like my soul crumbled. Well, <laughs> I feel like when I met her, it was the first time I ever met a woman who was actually really like comfortable with herself, and it is intimidating. It is because I'm like, wow, yeah. you don't have any insecurities or weird social twerks to hide behind. You're just real and cool. How does this happen? It is intimidating because it makes you be like, why am I not that comfortable with myself? Yeah, she's she's really cool. But we got we've got a you know, Savannah will be there this year. I love um, Savannah. Savannah's awesome, so she'll be there. I haven't we've seen got a, 
in years. This is my first convention in like four years. I know. I'm flattered, man. So it's the first convention. So you did 2019. Then after that, you went to, was it London or? or was I pregnant in Richmond? I was pregnant in Richmond last time I was there. I was pregnant. I Dude, didn't even Gally, know. That's what, that's what, that's where we figured out Golly was pregnant because she didn't, she was tired all the time and she didn't want to drink. And I'm like, babe, I think you're pregnant. And then of course she well, was. And obviously we, you were there with her. No, I remember, I remember going through this with you at the time, but I don't think any of us found out during the convention. It was right afterwards. Right. Yep. Right afterwards. Yep. Yeah. I went from Las Vegas to Richmond. Well, what? Oh yeah. Richmond, Virginia to Las Vegas, Las Vegas to London. It was like a month trip for me. I think total last time I was there. Yes. Can you imagine doing that now? I can't even imagine traveling for a month with uh, a kid. Yeah. Now it would feel better because I'm not pregnant this time. I'm not going to throw up the whole time. <laughs> That's true. Speaking of which, are you going to, are you going to bring a theist with you? No, this is honey. This is my first convention in four years. It's mommy's night out. Ah, uh, bring them, man. Andrew will be there. Andrew will be there the whole time. Oh, no, I haven't had alone time in four years. I am Dude, we can, t we can tie them together and they can just run around the convention. We'll put a little uh, air tag on them. Yeah, it would be cool. <laughs> but you know what I'm going to love more than that? A hotel room by myself. There you go. I love my son. He's my number one human in this world, but a hotel room by myself sounds Dude, I used to always think it was crazy when when parents would be like, "Yeah, I haven't seen my kid for two days, and I'm get and I miss him." And I, now it's the same thing with me, man. By the time I'm off work at night, I'm so excited to go see my kid. I know. And then like, and you, and then the days you spend the whole day with them, you're like, "Oh my god, go to sleep! Oh my god, go to sleep!" And they go to sleep, and you celebrate. And then after like two hours, you're like, "Hmm." Oh, just wake up and snuggle me. I just go. I'm just gonna go look at. You're like throwing that kid ASMR on, try to get him to sleep early. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you're going to be coming to Richmond this year uh, and you're doing a meet and greet. Are you looking forward to that? I haven't done I mean, I'm excited. It's weird to me still to this day that people actually want to come and meet me. But then I'm like, maybe I'm just so fucking blunt and awkward sometimes that people just want to get a kick out of me for a second i don't know but i really do love it i love meeting everybody shooting the shit with everybody just being real and saying what's up and honestly thanking people for the fucking support like yeah. it's so easy on the internet to see comments and likes and they're like numbers and words that's it and then when you actually get to meet people in person it's like it's real human connection it's really cool yeah. yeah, I remember uh, 2019, people were like bringing pictures that they had drawn of you. Fucking, I remember I had, people were coming, people were shaking. They were like shaking because they wanted to meet you so bad. It was crazy. I know. I know. And whenever they do that, I'm like, listen, have you ever heard? Don't meet your idols. You are going to be dis. I am not superwoman. I will do the best I can for you, but I don't f I floss every single day. I don't have time. I have lots of. Uh, things that are not 100% correct with me. I just hope, yeah, I hope I can. <laughs> it's like, keep this conversation short so I don't mess it up. <laughs> you got three let's, minutes. Let's keep it at a couple minutes so I don't offend you because it's going to happen. There's a, there's a fuse, but. Dude, we already, we've already got a hundred and some odd people who are ready to meet you. Already bought tickets and everything. So. Cool. It's going to be crazy. I don't think you have any time to tattoo. You're just going to be meeting people the whole time. I know. I, I, I'm nervous because I have like, yo, I have like a lot of people that want to get tattooed in Richmond. Like Maddie has a whole folder. There's like over a hundred people, I think that, and I'm like, am I even going to have time to tattoo with this thing? Ugh. Yeah. Well, you'll, we'll make sure you have time. And we do we typically uh, don't shut the, the place down so you can tattoo all night if you want, but I don't cool. think that would be helpful. That makes me, I hate being kicked out of conventions. I'm always the last one tattooing. Always. And it's kind of like a, a badge of honor, right? <laughs> I always used to love being the last one there, especially on Sundays. The only, when they break the whole convention down behind you. I've done it so many times. I'm like sad like you are carrying my lone suitcase out by myself. Everyone's breaking down all of the curtains. The only thing I don't like about it is that the bar's always closed by the time I leave. Ah. I just want one nightcap, you know? Well, the good thing about Richmond is we party all night long. 
Oh, I remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> no, I'm excited to have you again. Not to uh, be- And I really appreciate you coming. No, I am fucking stuck. I only have fond, hilarious, ridiculous memories of Richmond last time. Only good things. And for tattooers especially, I tell all tattooers, do this convention. You're like taken care of like it's a like it's a really excessively large family gathering but you still have like aunts and uncles that want to feed you and make sure you're healthy and happy the whole time you know you're like taken care of as a tattooer um it's a really good one and it's the yeah i appreciate that this is so dorky of me but i'm really fucking bad at like selling t-shirts and shit man people want them all the time but i just i don't know why i can't do it so for the first time since I won Ink Master, I have a couple cool fucking t-shirts I'm bringing to Richmond. They're going to be premiering at Richmond. There's going to be new merch. I think there's new like stickers, new prints, new keychains. We're trying to get a bunch of other stuff in like really cool shit, but I'm not 100% sure it's going to be ready. It's going to be ready. Yeah. Woo. Okay. We're going to have some cool fucking merch in Richmond. It's premiering there. You heard it first. Nice. So what is it? What do the t-shirts look like? Do they got ones for dudes? Yeah, there's dude ones too. Nice. Perfect. And you know what's dorky is like, I, I feel like such a goober, like selling my own name on a t-shirt and shit. I'm like, what am I doing? This is so weird. But the truth is, is that like all my friends that make t-shirts and all my tattooer friends that make t-shirts, dude, I wear them all the time. All the time I wear my friends' t-shirts and I love wearing them. You know what I mean? I fucking love rocking my friends' merch and stuff. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I'll make some shit. And it's super interesting because I, you know, when I opened Loose Screw Tattoo, you know, it was just Loose Screw Tattoo. And then when I got on Ink Master, it was like people were more interested in me than they were at the tattoo shop. So attaching my name to it, of course, helped the tattoo shop. And I noticed that people... The only merch that they would want to buy was one with my name on it, which is, of course, super awkward and super uncomfortable. But in the in the, the grand scheme of things, the reason you're making the merch is for your fans. So if they if that's something that they're asking know, for, then... it's something I know. Well, let me just say this: I got pissed off at Maddie. At to for those people that are watching that do not know who Maddie is, Maddie is my manager and basically life coach who you know, talks me off the ledge about man, four days a week, about four days. A week. Um, I got pissed off at her last week. Cause she's like, listen, everyone wants t-shirts with your face on it. So I order them. Okay. Everyone wants them. I ordered them. And I was like, I need to prove this. Now. We went through this whole thing, but she's fucking right. <laughs> He's right. And so, but Dude. we compromised and I redid the design a little bit and I actually feel really fucking cool about this one that's coming out. I ho- hopefully it comes out really cool. Awesome. Does that have rhinestones on it? No, but my banner does. You know what I did? I had to make a whole new banner. <laughs> I don't have a banner and I can't show up without a banner. You know what I did, Jesse? I spent nine hours hand gluing probably about 6,000 pearls on my fucking banner. I sat there with tweezers and glue and hand glued like 6,000 pearls on my banner just for Richmond. It's the only convention I have scheduled. So yeah. Now you're going to have to do a bunch more because Hello. we need to show that banner off. <laughs> uh-uh. hang it up. I'll hang it up outside of my house or something. Hang it up in the Elysium. All right. So I don't want to keep you on here too much longer, um, but I did want to talk about Elysium. So Elysium is the shop you work at, and this is in Boulder, Colorado. Nope. And you've got how many? Oh, it's not. Where's it at? Grand Rapids, is that right? Grand yeah. Grand Junction. Keep going. Grand Junction, yeah! You got it. All right. So, I haven't... so when okay. I met Arlo, when I met Arlo, he had just started this studio called Elysium. It was in a big brick Victorian house. Um, he had a couple of artists. Everyone was really fucking cool. Uh, but we called it the compound because it was this like large four-story Victorian house. And there were four apartments on the property so all the artists lived there and worked there no one locked their doors everyone had dog doors and everyone had dogs so it was a cult it was basically a cult. it was basically a cult for a couple of years there it was a hot tub it was a whole thing you know what I mean? it was a really really close knit shop for a couple of years it was fucking cool 
um kind of like the real real world but like early 2000s real world i guess anyway um and so when i met arlo um we kind of came we merged arlo and i merged in more in more ways than one <laughs> we started working together we reproduced every way there really is to merge we kind of did it and now uh elysium is growing and, and expanding and it's become intense and really amazing um we bought a hundred year old historic church in the historic section of grand junction um it's technically three levels that we just finished renovating the basement but it's been basically arlo's living art project for the last few years and like it is intense like every single fucking detail of this place has either been like me and arlo for days hand carving filigree to go around the doors or you know chiseling all the plaster out to reveal the original brick it's been like really invasively creative for the last few years and um we're really really proud of it um and grand junction's so cool out here we're, we're out we're out pretty far in the middle of nowhere but it's in between denver and salt lake so it's been a destination shop for a lot of tattooers to stop in um and so we've had, I mean, over the last two months, we had like nine guest artists. Um, it's been like really intense. And before that, I mean, we probably have about 30 to 35 guest artists that come on rotation and they come for the studio and the artists that we have, but they also come because this place is really cool. Um, it looks like a postcard pretty much anywhere you look any direction you drive in, you feel like you're in a different time in a different place. It's really a really fucking special place. So our clients and our guest artists and our artists love being here. Um, I don't know, kind of feels like a movie out here a little bit. It's really cool. Studio's dope. Our, our, our studio right now is stacked, stacked with like really crazy, impressive talent. The caliber of the art that's coming out is like really, really crazy. Um, the what? So when you guys oh, opened up in, the, uh, in the, the church, did you catch any friction from the locals at all? Oh my God. This is the coolest part about Grand Junction. So in Grand Junction is a very conservative community, right? So obviously opening a tattoo studio, not just in a church, but in the historic church in the historic district where there are no businesses was a big deal. We went through like a year and a half of Arlo and I would have to put on our like burgundy business suits and go down to city hall and go to the council meetings and do all this shit. And we weren't sure how it was going to go because it's super conservative historic place. We're trying to be, we're trying to push for not just changing a church into a tattoo studio, but putting a business on a historic street. So the, we had an uphill battle. And believe it or not, we had so much support from the community, from the town, from city council, from the mayor, from the vice mayor, to the point where like, we had people from the community showing up just to support us. We had so many people that they couldn't fit in the city council meeting. They had to sit outside and watch TVs. And we had, you know, the mayor and the vice mayor and everyone not only supporting us or saying, okay, actually standing up and thanking us for what we were doing for the community and for the progression we were bringing on such a high level. And so now Elysium and the city of Grand Junction are super well intertwined, um, We've hosted a bunch of community events. We're now part of the arts district. Um, we've done charity stuff, volunteer stuff, and we're trying to really integrate ourselves with the community um, the best that we can and really just bring people together in a really cool small town kind of way as well. So we go, we cater to everyone from local all the way to international and try to integrate it, you know, all together. Wow. That's really the, cool. That's awesome. The we're fr I'm friends with Anna. Her name is Anna Stout. She's the mayor of Grand Junction. She's freaking gorgeous. First of all, she is six, like so accomplished and cool. And she's this down ass bitch. Our mayor is this like 
36 year old hot down ass bitch that is intelligent and progressive and cool. She's awesome. Um, and then our vice mayor, we're also friends with his name is Abe and he gets tattooed and lasered at Elysium. So we're like, we're cool. We're cool. We're really comfortable with our community and, and all the people that you know, we're surrounded by. So did you say you did tattoo the mayor or no? I did not personally. I did not. But the Got vice it. mayor, Abe, um, gets tattooed and lasered to the studio. Awesome. And so on that note, I, you have tattooed a couple of celebrities too, right? The, in, did you tattoo my, the dude from Shark, Nake, uh, Shark Tank? Damon? Damon yeah. John? Damon John and Arlo are very, very close. Arlo tattoos Damon and he has for quite a while now, actually, but we've kind of That's like awesome. merged families a little bit. And now I'm like friends with Damon's wife and we hang out and do shit together. It's really cool. Um, Arlo's been tattooing a bunch of uh, pro athletes actually recently and Forbes awesome. dude. I usually, usually, the fuck am I saying? I've tattooed celebrities like um, I tattooed Drew Barrymore last year. Oh, and- that's awesome! I heard she's so sweet. She actually bought a painting here in uh, Richmond at at one of the restaurants that um, one of my ex girlfriends worked at, and she said she was such a sweet dude. Kid. She was so fucking cool. She was so fucking cool. She asked me to come back again and tattoo on. I tattooed her on her show, and she asked me to come back again and tattoo her. And I couldn't. I think I was filming or something. I couldn't make it, but she was amazing. Damn. She's she famous for Drew Barrymore. That's crazy. Oh, I just have a contract. With- <laughs> I have a contract with Barrymore. Um, but uh, I used to tattoo um, a lot of band dudes that are really cool. Um, Clinton Clinton Kelly from, he was on What Not to Wear. I don't know if anyone's ever watched What Not to Wear. But then he went on The Chew. Um, I used to tattoo uh, D. Snyder from Twisted Sister. who And his family, D. Snyder was fucking awesome um i think that's it as of late i don't know any of those people are they rappers twisted sister <laughs> I'm just kidding. i want to <laughs> rock fuck <laughs> all right all right i'm gonna quit embarrassing myself all right ryan thanks so much for uh being a part of my podcast i really Wait, appreciate you before you kick what? me off your podcast can i make an announcement yes Make an announcement. Elysium is hiring new resident artists. Do that new school artists? Is that what you said? We don't have any new school artists. If you want to come work for us, that'd be dope. You want to come out here? Perfect. Yeah, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna light it up over there. Get some get some color. Have you been, have you been to Colorado? I have. I actually I actually lived in a trailer park in Denver, Colorado, a long time really? ago. Really? Yeah. Oh, when trailer I was park kid. Super young. Yeah. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll, the other thing, I'll, go ahead. So you're hiring, you're looking for resident artists. Is there any yeah. stipulations? We, um, just be fucking cool and love adventure. And like, people aren't going to want to come here expecting New York City. It's a little fucking town, but it's, it's gorgeous. Like, I always tell people when I lived in New York City, all I did in New York, and maybe this is just me. But all I did in New York was go to the bar and drink and party and you go out, you go to the, uh, and it, it wasn't fulfilling. And so when I moved out here, it was like, oh, I could hang out with all of my friends and we could like take like an easy hike out into the desert and like lay and look at the stars. Like you could do like life shit, like inspiring, cool life shit with a really close knit, strong group of people that is open and friendly and cool. And um, we just want to inspire and be inspired and everyone paints together. There's like monthly paint nights and we all cook dinner for each other. We all spend Thanksgiving together and holidays. We're like a family out here, but we just opened the basement up and now there's like, it's like a whole nother level. It's like a 2,500 square foot level that is empty. We have a big media room. We have to, put together there's the studio is fucking crazy but we're finally opening the doors to some new resident artists it's been a while since we've taken anybody on and we're just kind of looking for people that want to come be a part of our family so how many artists are there thus far there's nine of us 
Woo. And how many are you looking to hire? Can I talk about, okay, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but we just sponsored Christina Taylor and her husband. Do you follow Christina Taylor? Is that a rapper? What? She's a like, <laughs> really fucking crazy um, Russian tattooer with the like, the bright blue hair that tattooed her on throat. Like crazy color, big, gorgeous, bright color, like realism shit. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. I am not familiar with her. Christina um, Taylor is, she is fucking crazy talented. She's smoking hot. She's cool as shit. Her and her husband, who's, I, I didn't even know. I don't know. I'm not on the internet that much, but her husband is a phenomenal tattooer as well. He does like black work, geometric, cool shit. The two of them are coming, I believe in November. Um, and then I think we'll be looking for like two or three more. So 13, 14 total, huh? We have room for like 30, but oh we want God. everyone, to, but we're not trying to pack it because we want everyone to have their own art area as well. So they could have an easel and a paint area and it's a big fucking studio. So we want people yeah. to have enough room to do other art and stuff too. So no one's packed on top of each other, like have your own space and do what you want with it, you know? So this is on two floors and you actually have a third floor that you could stock as well if you want. No, the third floor is the choir. So it's all these it was the choir of the church so we put this balcony in and arlo made the choir he had these big leather custom couches put in on the third level with these cool tables and shit so you can go up above everyone tattooing on the whole floor and like overlook everyone tattooing so we go up there and draw have dinner you know like away uh -huh. from all the it's really cool that's awesome <clears throat> damn 30 artists in one shop that would be insane <laughs> That would be crazy. It's like a mini uh, tattoo convention. That's almost as big as my tattoo convention. Uh, we're probably, we're at nine right now. We'll, we'll probably go about 13, 14 artists. We're looking for artists that want to progress. Like we paint together. Like we paint sure. together. We do like Jacob, Jacob and Arlo are really into ZBrush, crazy fucking digital sculpting. And now they got a 3D printer and they're making big, crazy sculptures and shit. Like, it's a cool place to be creative. Like we go on, we go up, like there's like thir 330 private, like private natural lakes up on the Mesa. Like we'll go and fucking swim all day. We'll fucking rent a cabin in the woods. Like we all get together and do lots of fun, cool nature shit and paint together and tattoo together. It's, it's a family. Like we don't just see each other while we're at work. We make like a kind of a life with each other. It's really, it's a really cool place. Sounds awesome. Well, I'm going to start packing shit up and, and yeah. head out there. And we're starting we'll, uh, a religion. Maybe now's not the time to talk about that. Anyway. <laughs> An alien flat earth religion? <laughs> yes, we're flat earthers. <laughs> we're not. All right. This episode is brought to you by Loose Screw Tattoo. If you want to get tattooed by some of the best tattoo artists in the entire world, the best place to do it is right here in Richmond, Virginia at Loose Screw Tattoo. We're located in the heart of Carytown. And we hope to see you soon. Are there any new seasons of Ink Master? Anything coming out anytime soon? Yeah, we, yes. We just, well, not just, we finished um, season 15. And Ooh. there, yes, we filmed another season. It is about to launch. Um, there are a few new surprises I am really fucking excited about. And I have to say, this is season 15 of Ink Master, but I have done Ink Master, Two Seasons of Angels, Grudge Match, Clash of the Coaches, season 14. This is my seventh season being a part of, or eighth, yeah, being a part of, you know, Ink Master. And this last season we just filmed that's about to premiere is by far one of my favorite seasons we've done so far. Absolutely. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. And I mean, I, you know, I feel like Andrea is so good at this too. It's like every time you feel like there's nothing else she can do, she comes out with something even better. Um, tell me about it. And I will say too, the hardest part for me from being like a former contestant to now being on the other side of the panel and, and being one of the judges, um, a lot of the tattoos, I'm like, Ooh, the canvases this season are fucking nuts they ask for the craziest shit and i'm like thank god i am on this side of the panel right 
but the flash challenges I miss so much. And, and the whole season I kept being like, yo, can you guys set up like some extra setups back here? So like the judges can like do our own little flash challenge off offset, you know, because we're so excited about the, and so there were a, a, a few different challenges where me and the other judges who will be announced, <laughs> who will be announced, um, would go like offset, you know, while they're working and do our own little challenge. Like we would do the challenge as well and kind of play with each other and challenge each other. Cause it's exciting. And it, it, the, it's literally so inspiring that it, it inspired us judges to go backstage and do our own little competition. Cause the challenges are so fucking cool. That's awesome. So are the judges the same this season as they were last season? Some of us, am I allowed to say, can I say, okay. Drum roll, please. Da -da 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 -da. DJ Tamby. That DJ. only makes sense. So Come on. That motherfucker. No one's going to hound DJ's ass more than I am. I swear to God. I, I am most aggressive to the people I love the most. But no one deserves him more. He has proven himself over and over and over and not only is he an extremely accomplished and talented tattooer, but he knows this game better than anyone at this point. Wow. Th yeah, I mean, he's definitely, definitely deserves it. I thought he should have been a judge a long time ago. I mean, the dude's so, a freaking same. wizard, man. And he's bashing out every style as good as the best people in the world. Yo, even on season 14, and that was the thing about season 14, ultimately, like, I didn't want fucking DJ to win again. He's already won a <laughs> bunch of times. Like... But you can't debate it. You can't debate it. When that motherfucker could pull off traditional, insane, perfect traditional Japanese that makes you feel like, wow, they must have studied like real traditional Japanese. And then do a six hour hyper realistic color portrait that's this fucking big. Come on, dude. That's the definition of an ink master. Like there's no one that deserves it more than DJ does. So, um, um, so the judge panel this season is Joel Madden, who is hosting, who is one of my favorite humans on the planet for his wisdom and his advice and his insight. He is an inspiring motherfucker. Um, Nico Hurtado, who I have looked up to for a very long time. And I can't wait to actually talk about Nico and what he does off camera. I can't believe that motherfucker. <clears throat> Nico is a fucking prodigy like i can't believe how his mind actually works like behind the scenes he is an artist i swear to god he's like a renaissance artist that's like um reincarnated into a tattooer's body at this point you know during the season nico's like i'm just gonna do a little painting quick i'm just gonna do a little painting quick and he'll bust out these oil paintings that look like they should be in the smithsonian like an hour hour and a half by the end of the season, he had a whole fucking wall. I was like, what is this? The fucking MoMA? It's crazy. He's crazy. He's crazy. Um, so Joel is hosting. Myself is judging. Nico Hurtado and DJ Tampi. So it. it is. And trust me, those all those dudes at this point are like my fucking brothers. So there is a lot of sibling rivalry that happens throughout the entire season. I, uh. Yeah, I, I'm not a, an aggressive, violent person by any means, but if I was going to be, man, DJ would fucking get it. <laughs> nice. I'm not, though, but, you know. You know, the crazy thing about Nico is I remember seeing Nico's work after he'd been tattooing for, like, four years. And I think I'd been tattooing for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years at the time, by the time I'd seen his work. And it was the best work that I had seen in my entire life. And he had only been tattooing for four years. And then you start hearing that he's using rotaries. I mean, I would say from my perspective, Nico was probably one of the driving forces for the rotary movement. Because before that, rotaries were, were considered like kind of taboo. If you use a rotary, you're a weirdo. The, the thing is about Nico is when I first met Nico, I met him and he was on such a pedestal and such a platform that everyone put him on. You know, um, I wasn't sure what to expect out of him. And I've met him many times in many situations. I've partied with him. I've hung out with him. And now that the two of us are, um, we're peers in a way where we're co-hosting, we're, we're co-judges on this competition. It's a different type of relationship and a different type of dynamic. And so I'm seeing Nico in, in a lot of a, a different light 
than I did previously. It's not a convention circuit. It's not a, you know, guest spot. It's, it's this really insane opportunity that we get to be a part of. And Nico never ceases to surprise and amaze me and impress me, not just by his artwork. His, he's a good fucking dude. And I think he's a lot deeper than some people realize. Like he is really inspirational. And 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 I don't think there's ever been a time where I've like gone to Nico to talk about something where he didn't like look me in the fucking eye and listen. He's a wise dude. Um, I'm really proud of him and I'm really happy to know him in, in this light, especially. And, um, I don't know, I'm having almost like an, like an Ink Master Angels moment where I'm like, like, cause we peaked on angels. I feel like there have been moments with that judging panel with Joel and Nico and DJ, where the four of us will be in these intense conversations. It almost feels like you're in like a junior high sleepover and everyone is figuring out who they are, you know, we're like helping each other and inspiring each other in a in these in these ways that are so man progressive and and even though filming is long and it's hard and the hours are are relentless and it's so many days in a row and everything i legitimately passionately appreciate and enjoy every single moment that I get to be with that crew in, in, in that situation. Like it's inspiring for me as a judge. And the, the cool thing about this last season that we just filmed season 15, that you guys have to fucking watch. Um, the cool thing was about all of us is like what, what you guys see on camera with us debating the tattoos and judging these tattoos and from all of our different perspectives and all of that, the camera cuts and we go backstage, you know, off camera and the debate continues. Like, we'll go have lunch together and fucking fight it out for 45 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, we'll we'll get into it passionately about the tattoos that were done or about art or about technique. And all of us come out with growth. You know, we all grow from these conversations and stuff. So I think it's, um for me, it was personally one of the best experiences I've had in a really long time. And I think it's going to show this season. How about the the contestant pool? Is there a substantial amount of great artists on this season or do you so, feel like it can compete with what's happened in the past? So I'm a really bad secret keeper. Uh, <laughs> I can't have, I will not tell. Stop. Maddie's looking at me like I'm going to spill the beans. I'm not. It's a few more weeks. Um, but uh, the contestants this season, this is what I will say. They're among some of the most diverse contestants Ink Master's ever seen um, in every way. Diverse uh, style-wise, diverse culturally, diverse backgrounds, diverse where they're from. Like it, It's a really broad, broad spectrum of artists this season. And I think what they're bringing to the table are these new styles that Ink Master previously hasn't really celebrated. From me, Nico, uh, DJ, and Joel, what we want to see is innovation. We want to see art. We want to see creativity. We want to see you push the fucking limits, right? I don't want to see a rose. I don't want to see a rose. No, I don't. Want, you have any flower to choose from? Show me something I haven't seen and do it right. Show me something I haven't seen and do it right. Surprise me. It, it, um, wow me. Make me feel something from your art because tattooing has come to that point and so has ink master and now it's the time where we should not be debating season 15 technical fundamentals everyone should be aware of what is expected of you as a tattooer in terms of the quality of the art that you're putting in the skin now it's time that that standard has been set to push the fucking boundary on what tattoos could be and so this season is innovative in a way where it's almost um, a new perspective. And these are the perfect artists to support that new perspective. I love that. I love that. I definitely, definitely wish you guys were my judges at one, one time. Cause that would have been a lot more interesting. You would have won, motherfucker. <laughs> you would have won. Well, that's awesome. So, so there's no potatoes this season. Everyone is freaking awesome. Potatoes. There are potatoes. The, pot the potatoes are fun to watch, man. I love, I love to watch potatoes. <laughs> but you know what I'll say? Even through the potatoes, 
this season, I actually really, really, really liked all of the contestants. Yeah, I really did. Sure. I liked all I, of them. They were fucking cool. I found that some of my favorite people on season two were the ones that just weren't that good, but they were just fun, good people, you know? Um, Man, you, all, like you said, always, you live with them. Aren't they always you, your favorite type of people, though? Just easy, cool, fun fucking people that are just feel good to be around? I don't know. For sure. For sure. Is it hard to, I mean, I'm sure, are there people you're judging that you feel like are better than you at, at yes. certain styles and stuff like that? And that's got to be a little difficult to try to even, you know, find anything wrong with their work. And, and, you know, if you do have multiple artists that are doing amazing work, it's like, how do you kick one off? Yeah. Know? Um, so I've talked to my therapist about this. It's called imposter syndrome. <laughs> That's what the term is. Um, because hmm, the phrase I've been saying to people recently to try to explain how I feel is like, sometimes the best coaches aren't the best players, right? True. Yeah. Like I am not the best tattooer in the world. I'm not, I'm, I'm good at what I do and I'm proud of what I do, but I can't beat someone in a fucking Japanese back piece. Maybe I could, maybe I'll fucking go for it and try, but I'm not going to claim that, I, that I can. Right. But I have dedicated the majority of my life, life to understanding what constitutes for a, a good tattoo. And so I'm surrounded every single day, both in Ink Master and in the studio with uh, such a wide variety of artists and so many different styles. And I've luckily for me, I'm so grateful that I've established an education in, in multiple styles, seeing it firsthand, traveling the world, watching the masters of each style work physically in person, trying to understand what it means to be the best in all of those categories. Um, and Ink Master is sort of this like microcosm of the entire industry put into this one competition. And it's like, who has all of the knowledge of not only what these styles are, but how to do them properly. And um, there were a few tattoos that were done this season that actually gave me goosebumps. Actually, there was one tattoo that was done this season, and I can't talk about it yet. You'll know when you see it. There was one tattoo that was done that, and all of the judges off camera, we stay for hours and examine these tattoos. I mean, close up in person, every fucking pore. I have a list of notes on my phone of every thought that I have about the tattoo as I'm seeing it in person up close. There was one tattoo that was done this season, and Nico and I were on our hands and knees on the ground looking at this tattoo and nico said to me he would go he goes yo i'm not gonna lie i don't even know how he fucking did that nico said this nico said this and i'm like if you don't get it this is like me watching a fucking quantum science documentary on the mechanics of, you know what i mean it's <laughs> beyond beyond and so there were a bunch of tattoos that bombed fucking hard this season. I mean, bombed, bombed, painful bomb, painful. Like, it's hard to look you in the eye knowing you have that tattoo. Uh, but the majority of the tattoos that were done were legitimately inspiring. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I can say much more than that. They were fucking inspiring. They were really cool, groundbreaking, innovative, new to Ink Master. New. I feel revitalized after this last season because the artwork is just so it's needed. It was needed. It's a, it's a That's really awesome. refreshing wave of really fucking cool, new, modern, innovative, inspiring shit. That's done fucking well. You got to watch this season. It's a good one. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm inspired. I'm excited. I want to see that. You have to, you got to watch so, me do on DJ the whole time. I almost, <laughs> a little wedgy every episode so do you have a, a release date do you know when this is uh when the new season is going to air am i allowed to say that i'm looking at maddie like am i allowed to say this <laughs> november 1st Woo! that's a day before my birthday that's awesome hell yeah, yeah man so um, so season 15 that's like i mean how many other 
reality TV shows have gone that long. I mean, I know there are, you know, you got like uh, Survivor's on season 34, isn't it? Survivor. But I mean, 15, if you're running 15 seasons, something's going good. Well, the thing is about Ink Master is like, and what I've learned about it being on new, like both sides of it and everything. And also like being a normal fucking person from a small town of people that, you know, are watching the show. It's, it's hard to get tired of because art is all about passion, right? Art comes from emotion. So when people that are competing are legitimately putting their heart and soul into this shit, it's legitimate. You can't fake it. You can't fake that. And you can't fake creativity. And when you watch someone have it, really have it, right? You can't help but like root for them. And so I think Ink Master is a, and a, has an amazing thing going. I think the season in particular, especially because of the new judge panel and the new perspective and the wave of where the industry is going. I think it's everything that everyone loves and has always loved about Ink Master plus a fresh perspective on what is possible to do to hum to human skin. But in a way with the knowledge of how is it going to last, right? And yeah. I think we've finally hit that sweet spot of um innovation and classic beauty and longevity and uh yeah. I can't say more. I wish I could say more. I want to talk about it so fucking much. I've been waiting so long to talk about it, but you just have to watch and see. Any drama? Anybody fighting? So much drama. Are you kidding? Me and DJ fought every single fucking day. <laughs> Mostly about what we were going to order for lunch. <laughs> nice. And then we tattooed matching hot dogs on each other. Oh, that didn't go well. Wait, did you get a color one or a black and gray one? I got black and gray. Woo! Did he get color or black and gray? A hot dog on DJ. And I used it. It was my first time using a new machine, new ink, needles I've never used under a really high pressure. It didn't turn out good. He actually didn't heal super well. And it humbled my ass fucking down. And it reminded me that every tattooer has good days and bad days. <laughs> you can be the so best tattooer in the world and you can still have a bad day, dude. Unfortunately, mine was on DJ and his ankle got real swollen and he limped like this for days. Watch. <gasps> Go. What's wrong with my leg? Like it was falling off. Like it was falling <laughs> off. And Nico would be like, uh, dude, uh, maybe you should wash it and like lift it up. Nico was like, okay, DJ. Okay. Literally <laughs> limp. Like I was like, can I get you a crutch? Can I get you a crutch? Ryan, thanks so much for being on my podcast, Tattoos, Art, and Web 3. I appreciate you as always. And I'm excited to see you at the Richmond Convention in three and a half weeks, October 20th Woo! through the 22nd. We're going to have a lot of fun. I don't know if we're going to remember it all, but it's going to be fun. Hey, I remember like 60% of the last one, and it's all good, dude. It's all good memories. I can't wait. Awesome. My first convention in four years. I hope to see you there, obviously, and hang out with you and your mom and your family and feel like I'm related to you because that's what it felt like last time. Um, and see everybody there. Can't wait. You can you can snuggle my – you can hug my kid. Think about – He's going to make me kiss my kid. I know. He's so awesome. I'm excited. I wish they could have met. We could have – like I said, we could have handcuffed him together and put some little air tags on him and just – Oh, I have an idea. The you guys can all come out here. Ah, that's a great idea. We can chill. That'll be a good relaxing trip. Nature awesome. family trip. You're invited anytime. Thank you, Ryan. Maddie, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And we will see you later. Bye. See Ryan Ashley at this year's Richmond Tattoo Convention, happening October 20th through the 22nd.